Amen. Praise the Lord. Our text is going to be taken from Matthew 5. Matthew 5, we're reading verses 43 through 48. This is a very popular, very well-known passage of scripture. I think that the Lord has uh, a message for you, for certainly for me, gave it to me first, and now I want to share it with you if that's okay. Here begins the reading of God's word. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus is switching things up. He's changing th things up. That's what the word but usually means. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Verse 45. So that you may be sons of your fathers who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain to the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors, I want you to see sinners, do the same. Verse 47, and if you greet only your brothers, what's more are you doing than anyone else? Do not even the Gentiles, read sinners, do the same. Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So far, that is the scripture. And the subject tonight is loving your enemies. Loving your enemies. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, on November 17th, 1957, preaching this message, love your enemies, he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. 1957, those words were spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So love is paramount. Love is paramount. In his book, Grace Forgiving, Stephen Olford tells the story of a Baptist pastor during the American Revolution, right? The name of the pastor was Peter Miller. He lived in the town of Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And he enjoyed the friendship of General George Washington, who, as you know, became the first president of the United States. In Ephrata, there also lived a man by the name of Michael Whitman. The story says that he's an evil man, and he did everything that he could to oppose and humiliate Pastor Miller. Well, one day Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and was sentenced to die. Pastor Miller heard of his plight and traveled 70 miles on foot to Philadelphia to plead for the life of this traitor, this person who hated him. After listening to the case, General Washington said, no, Peter, I cannot grant you the life of your friend, even though you've traveled 70 miles to the courthouse. My friend, exclaimed the old preacher, he is the bitterest enemy that I have. What? cried Washington. You walk 70 miles to save the life of your enemy? Now, that puts the whole matter in a different light, he said. Therefore, I will indeed grant your petition to pardon him. And he did. Pastor Peter Miller then took Michael Whitman back to their hometown, Ephrata, no longer enemies, but now friends. And the question I have is, what would you do to convert an enemy to a friend? Right? So as you can imagine, this, this teaching tonight is, is about going beyond the, the, the normal call of duty. This, this admonition that God gives us in Matthew 5 to love our enemies appears in his probably his most famous sermon in Matthew 5. Here, Jesus is presenting an alternative an alternative to the most common and frequent manner of dealing with one's enemies. You may find this contrast evidence in, in the words that he used 
you have heard it was said, so-and-so, but I say to you something else. He, he's, he's switching things up. Which, by the way, if you watch Jesus' teachings and listen to his words carefully, he's always doing that. He's always challenging your belief system and changing what you once thought was truth. And in this case, he's, he's doing exactly that. Now, for the context, please remember that during this time of Jesus' uh, life, some sectors of Judaism held an outright hatred for anybody who wasn't like them. They had animus, animosity against uh, the Samaritans. Remember the Good Samaritan? They had animosity or hatred against the Romans. And, and for the most part, in most Gentiles in general. Now, this animosity created a relational rule of its own, which, which basically boiled down to you should love your neighbor but hate your enemy, right? But in Matthew 5, 43, Jesus corrected this and reminded them of the law of Moses, which said, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. Leviticus 19, verse 18, and, and reiterated this in his new commandment. This is how Jesus mixed it and, re, and, and repurposed it. He said, love one another, period, in, in John 13, 34. Now, when Jesus commanded us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, he was raising the bar and establishing a brand new standard for relationships. This would take both his supporters and his critics by surprise. Uh, when Jesus said these words, it was not only a command for us to follow, it was also a signal to us as to what lengths that he would go to, and by extension, how far we should also go if we wanted to be his disciple, if we wanted to help, if we wanted to restore someone if we wanted to support a colleague, if we wanted to encourage the same behavior in others, is to love them. Love, as it turns out, would be the God solution to forgiveness. Jesus proclaimed to the crowds listening to his Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew 5 that, that they knew that they were to love their neighbor because the commandment to love was given to us in the Old Testament. And they knew the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 18 says, and I quote, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So they knew, they knew that, that, that law. The fact that we must therefore hate our enemy was something extra. That was an incorrect inference drawn from the law by the Jews, because there's no scripture which explicitly says, hate your enemy. So the Pharisees somehow misapplied some of the Old Testament passages about hatred of God's enemies, passages such as we see in Psalms uh, 139 verse 19, Psalm 140 verse 9 through 11, but Jesus came to replace this idea with an even higher standard. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Matthew 5, check it out. Jesus goes on to explain that loving those who love us, easy peasy. He says, even the sinners do that. The unbelievers do that. But then he commands us to be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. This reference to being perfect is, is actually pointing to Jesus's perfect sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Uh, we can only be perfect in God's eyes when he sees us through the blood of Jesus. Amen, somebody. And, and that is, is expertly explained all throughout scripture. This is the reason why all believers need to be completely covered by the blood. We can only achieve perfection through Jesus's covering. And how do we achieve that? Well, Matthew 26, verse 26 tells us. 1 John 1 and 7 tells us. Acts 20 and 28 tells us. Colossians 1 and 20 
tells us. I want you to look up these scriptures on your own. Ephesians 1 and 7 tells us. Hebrews 9, 17. Hebrews 9, 22. Hebrews 13, 12. It is the blood of Jesus shed in love. Come on, somebody. Shed in love that covers all of us, covers our sins, covers our mistakes, covers our weaknesses, so that when the Lord sees us, he sees us through this veil of the blood which was shed in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus explained to his followers that they should adhere to the real meaning of God's law by loving their enemies as well as their neighbors. And so a Pharisee trying to trick trying to trick Jesus say, said to Jesus, who then is my neighbor? Luke 10, 29. It is at that time when Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here Jesus taught that his followers must demonstrate love, not just to Jews, but love to all kinds of people, even a Samaritan. No matter what faith, nationality, personality, and this included your enemies as well. So, so if you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, uh, then you truly reveal that Jesus is the Lord of your life. I hope this is making sense to somebody. So then Jesus goes on to use an illustration in this text. He said, uh, the sun rising and the rain falling on both the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. Jesus was therefore showing God's undiscriminating love to all people. Uh, Jesus, Jesus was explaining that God doesn't discriminate. And so his disciples must, therefore, reflect his character and, a, and exhibit that same undiscriminating love for both friends and foe alike. Hallelujah. Jesus is teaching us that we must live by a higher standard than what the world expects us to do. Notice that this is a standard that is usually impossible for us to attain by our own efforts. It is only through the power of God's spirit that his people can truly love and pray for those who intend to do them harm. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do that which is right in the sight of everyone. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, he says, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, God says. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, watch this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. Overcome evil with good. I wish we could continue to do this. I wish we did more of that. Finally, after giving us this admonition to love our enemies, Jesus then gives us this surprising command, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. As sons of your fathers, we are to be perfect, even as he is perfect. Here, Jesus is again pushing the bar even higher and, and inviting us into, into perfection, into his perfection. Man, this is, as I said before, clearly impossible for sinful man to achieve. This is unattainable. This standard is way above our pay grade, if you, if you will, right? But it's exactly what the law itself demanded. Read James 2.10. So, so how can Jesus demand us to do something that he knows is impossible for us to do. Well, he, he later tells us, with man, he says in Matthew 19, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. 
That which God demands, only he can accomplish, including the demand to love our enemies. I want you to be thinking about that for a moment because when, when, when someone does something to us that clarifies that they really don't like us, uh, our natural inclination is to do it back to them. When Jesus says what is impossible for man becomes possible for those who give their lives to Jesus Christ, what he's talking about, the Spirit of God will enable you to love them back. And there are several places in the Bible where we are commanded to pray for our enemies, and love our enemies. Luke 6.27, for example, he says, but I say to you, do here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Did you hear that? Romans 12, 20. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. When was the last time you were kind to someone that was evil and ungrateful? Yeah, that's what I thought. And so our, our natural inclination, our our human inclination is to is to lash out. And if someone does wrong to us, we do wrong back to them. Someone lies on you, you feel like, well, I'm in my right to lie back. So we come now to Matthew 5, our text. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I'm going to change that up a little bit. I'm telling you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. I can imagine that the crowd that's around him, the, 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 the Jews who are hearing this, scoffing at Jesus saying, what? You want me to love my enemies, the Samaritans? All right, let's make it plain, let's make it plain. The war that's currently in Israel right now what if the, the people of Israel, the Israelis, the Jews, were to obey this and say, well, Messiah says for us to love our enemies. They, they wouldn't be at war with the Palestinians today. Uh, love overcome everything. That's the, that's the, the answer, right? And it is clear that Jesus expects us to pray for our enemies as well. What if the folks today that's fighting were to do that? To pray for their enemies instead of destroying them. So let's see what the Bible says about that. By the way, this is the quickest way for you to uproot uh, hate out of your heart for someone. If you commit yourself to pray for them. If uh, whenever you see them, your face becomes disfigured. Whenever you hear their voice, it, it, it stirs up evil inside of you for them. The best way for you to get rid of that once and for all is to start praying for them. This is why Jesus tells us to do that. Pray for your enemies. Trust me, you can't pray for someone and continue to hate them. Not, not, not pray really pray. So our first response to this question is probably not the right one. When someone wrongs us, we, we would like to pray that God brings down fire on them. And, and then we may be tempted to, to, to pray. The, there are these Psalms and other scriptures that, that, that brings down curse on God's enemies. And you will just pray one of those prayers. And sit back and wait for God to exact vengeance on your on your behalf, much like much like Brother Jonah did outside of Nineveh, right? But that is not what Jesus meant by praying for our enemies. Jesus had something better in mind that will benefit us as well as our enemies. Like I said, you cannot pray for someone and continue to hate them. 
I'll say it again for clarity. You cannot pray for someone, seriously pray for them, and continue to hate them. It's impossible. Yeah, I think over time that 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 hate will be broken by love. When you when you call their name to God and say, Lord, I don't know why I can't get along with this person. They just irk me. Is that a real word? I have to look that up. They they just bug me. Whenever, whenever I see them, whenever I hear them, hatred is 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 welled up in my heart for them. But if you start praying for them, that hatred will turn to love over time. It won't turn to love immediately. Maybe it will turn to indifference. It won't bother you as much. And then you'll begin to see something in them that you want to admire. So you start to admire them. And then you'll see something else that you find quite interesting and attractive and appealing. And then you start talking to them that way. And over time, over time, over time, what was once hate will be transformed by the power and spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they when they used to gossip about you, uh, you would gossip back about them. When they lied about you, you would lie back about them. They smeared your reputation. Well, you smear theirs too. But like I said, Jesus is calling us to a higher standard. He doesn't want us to do like the, quote, Gentiles do. The sinners, he's saying. He demonstrated that standard by never retaliating when someone wronged him. Just look at Jesus. Look how he responded. And, and oh, by the way, they wronged him a lot. Yeah, His own people rejected his message. John 1, 11, The religious leaders mocked and tried to trap him all the time. John 8, 6. His own family was ashamed of him and tried to make him stop preaching. Mark 3.21. And his friends, his friends deserted him in his worst moment. Mark 4.50. And the city, the city who cried, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When he arrived in town, remember, they crucified, they shouted, crucify him a few days later. Mark 15.13. So, so Jesus had plenty of enemies. He didn't make this up like out of nowhere. He was relying on, he was relying on his own personal experience. So Jesus had plenty of enemies. And when he said to pray for your enemies, he knew what he was talking about. Do you do that? At work, maybe. There's a coworker that just rubs you the wrong way. I challenge you. Start praying for him. Hallelujah. This is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. Start praying for them and see, see how that changes things. Remember Jesus' example? Uh, he gave a perfect example for praying for our enemies when he was dying on the cross. You remember in, his, in the middle of his agony, he cried out, Father, forgive them. Praying for his enemies. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34. He is dem he's not telling you anything that he hasn't done, is what I'm saying. So he's showing you by his example, Father, forgive them. For they don't really know what they're doing. They think they know what they're doing, but they don't really know what they're doing. And later on, he says, if they had known, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory which proves that that they didn't know what they were doing because he said if they had known they wouldn't have done it amen so he talked to his father about the people who were harming him he he did not ask for their destruction and clearly could have and he didn't pray for revenge either he prayed that they would be forgiven father forgive them i'd like to i'd like to believe that i would do that even in the gravest of circumstances that I would do that because I want to be Christ-like. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to emulate his example, his behavior, the things that he said and did. I'd like to do those things. So Jesus had compassion 
even on the people who were deceived into crucifying him. People who believed they were doing the right thing by killing the son of God. He prayed for them and, and begged the Holy Spirit for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They had no idea what was actually taking place. They didn't see the spiritual uh, uh, underpinnings. They had no idea how wrong they were. And when Jesus said they they don't know they do not know what they're doing, he, he hinted at this important factor to keep in mind when we pray for our enemies. The enemy we pray for hurt us from their own hurt. You know, you've you've heard people say that hurt people hurt people, right? Well, they're 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 hurting you or wanting to hurt you from their pain, from their pain. Their thinking may be influenced by the devil himself. Second Corinthians 4:4. 4, 4. Their attitudes may have been shaped by their past wounds. Read Judges 15, 7. And I'm giving you all these scriptures because I want you to go read them. I want this to be Bible study. And when you're done here. You can go read these scriptures if you're writing them down or when you listen to the podcast, have your Bible open and and, and read these scriptures. They Their attitudes may have been shaped by their past wounds. And in Judges 15, 7, it clarifies that. Their actions may have been manipulated by their friends, their peers. 2 Kings 12, 13, 12 and, uh, 13 and 14. Of course, none of this excuses the behavior or minimize the damage that they will cause, but it helps to explain the why of the matter. People, people do what they do usually for a reason, don't they? They do it for a reason, right? They, they may not be valid reasons. <laughs> it seems valid to them. But the, the commandment is, Pray for them nonetheless. And so how do we pray for those who hurt us? How do we pray? Uh, how do we pray for those who have hurt us and never tried to make it right? Well, number one, we can pray that God, God's will be done, that he will open the eyes of their heart and that they will be enlightened about the truth. Read Ephesians 1.18. When enemies set themselves against us, they lack understanding. They are reacting from the flesh instead of responding from the spirit. And so we can pray that God will open their hearts uh -huh, with understanding so that they will learn from their mistakes and grow wiser and grow wiser over time. That's the first thing. Number two. As we pray for our enemies, we can pray for their repentance, 2 Timothy 2, 25. It says this, opponents must be gently instructed. Did you hear that? Gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So it is God who softens the heart enough to bring someone to repentance. When we pray for our enemies to repent, we know we are praying in accordance with God's will because he also desires repentance. Hallelujah. 2 Peter 3 and 9 confirms that. Amen. Number three, when we pray for our enemies, we can ask that our hearts will remain soft and useful if the Lord wants to use us to accomplish his plan in the lives of our enemies. Didn't know the wise man in Proverbs 15 tell us to be wise in our responses? A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh and grievous words stirs up anger. So we ought to, we, we can be the instrument of change in their lives. When they see you respond that way, they're gonna be like, wait a minute, I thought you were my enemy. And that is probably true. That's how they are thinking, but they don't know what God's doing on the inside of you, right? They view you as an enemy, but do you view them as an enemy? 
But when you respond with kindness, when you respond with, with, with love, when you respond with gentleness and mercy, the situation is often diffused within moments because it's going to catch them by surprise. They're going to be like, whoa, I didn't expect that. Nothing is more convicting than a gentle response to a hateful, rude action. I, I have so many examples of this. When, when someone is rude to you and, and, and disrespects you and you turn the other cheek, when you, when you say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Please forgive me. Now, now they were rude to you and you're turning around and doing what they should be doing. Nothing is more convicting than that. It's a gentle response of the Holy Spirit. When someone is hateful to you and you respond in a kind, gentle, loving way, uh, that's what turning the cheek is all about. Matthew 5, 39. Satan desires discord, so he tries to stir up our fury against one another. And he coaches us to respond the way that they responded. He wants us to get into a fight. But we should pray that God keep our hearts soft towards the offenders so that his goodness, hallelujah, will be revealed to them through us. They will see your response and they'll say, wait a minute. What, what's wrong? What's different about this cat? And they'll say, ah, there's something different. I'm going to have to find out. And they'll continue to observe you. That will give you an opportunity to say, but the Lord Jesus has changed my heart. I don't, I don't react like that anymore. I used to. I'll tell you something about myself. Um, when I was younger, um, I used to get angry about stupid stuff. I used to get real angry, so much so that um, I would get terrible headaches. Right? I would, I would, I would get in a fury. My my temper was so out of control that I would cry. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I'm I'm different now. Thank the Lord Jesus, right, for His Spirit. But when when I was younger, and I mean, I'm not talking, you know, four or five. I'm talking like, you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I was. I was, you know, even older than that, before I got the Holy Spirit. I was out of control, y'all, out of control. And I remember it. And, and if I forget, I go ask my mama. and she, She'll tell me. But when, when you respond differently, when you allow the Spirit of God to transform you from the inside, and, and, I, and I said it that way intentionally, when you allow the Spirit of God to transform you, because God's not going to muscle his way on you and force you, put you in a headlock and say, be ye transformed. No. He's going to gently entreat you, and you have to allow the Spirit of God to transform you. You have to allow him to, to massage your heart and make it soft. Amen. And we should pray that God keeps our hearts soft, especially to those who would offend us. Because those who love us, they're going to love you. And his goodness will be revealed to those who don't love you through your responses, through your kindness. So number four, as we pray for our enemies, we can pray that God will work in their lives because of this offense to bring about his purposes. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6, 10. It is always right to ask God's will to be done in any situation. Amen, amen. Amen. We should pray until we want what he wants. If he wants to bless your enemy, I want that too. If he wants you to serve your enemy in some way, then that's what I want as well. Prayer is the aligning of our wills with God's will. Think about it that way. When we pray for our enemies, we need to wrestle through our emotions until we truly want what's God, what God wants for them. 
We want God's best in their lives. So loving and praying for our enemies is not a natural response to their mistreatment of you, but we remember that we were once the enemies of God ourselves, but now we're, we're his children. Ah, uh, yes, we could now intercede for others who are still, the Bible says far off, far from the commonwealth of Israel. Colossians 1, 21. And in doing so, we keep our own hearts free from bitterness, Hebrews 12, 15. Hallelujah. So in praying for our enemies, and I'm done, we, we become more like Christ. We keep ourselves in harmony with God's will, which is how every human being was originally designed to be. We were originally to des designed to be in harmony with Jesus, you remember? The Bible says that in the cool of the day, God would come down to look for his friends in harmony, in harmony. Yeah. And we communed with him. We were on one accord. But when Eve was deceived and Adam sinned, that harmony was broken. And then when God came down to look for his homies, he said, where y'all at? Adam, where art thou? That harmony was broken. And so he had to put his plan in place to restore us to him. That's what the cross was about. Shedding innocent blood for the guilty so that he could win us back to himself. Amen. 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 That's that's all I have for you tonight. I hope it was encouraging. I hope um I said something that blessed you.